Peter Crone, welcome to the Journey on Podcast. All right, thank you, my friend. Nice to be here. Hey, it's nice to have someone who lives in America who can pronounce my name without without being uh, prompted too. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, were you you're, you an Aussie originally though, or yeah, where are you from? Re- originally yeah, Australian. Yeah. Okay, got it. Originally Australian. I lived, down there for, I lived down there for a couple of years. I loved it. I had such a great time in Sydney. Oh yeah, I bet you loved it there. So yeah. you know, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast, Peter, because you know, with what I do separate from the podcast, which is horse stuff, the biggest the biggest thing I'm trying to do with people is ha- get them to have a perspective change. And you are like the, for me, you're like the champion of perspective changes. You know, I follow a lot of people like on social media and stuff that are in the, you know, transformational space or whatever, but I've mm-hmm. never had anybody, I've never heard anybody who can be so succinct like you are. You will say one sentence and I'll have to stop and stare at the wall for a while. And it's funny how many people I meet that have never heard of Peter Crone. And I'm like, you've never heard of Peter Crone. So one of the right. reasons having you on here is I want to pick your brain about some things, but I also want to share you with my audience because I just feel like everybody needs to get their, their dose of Peter Crone. Well, I appreciate the very generous words. And it's, um, yes, for whatever reason, I sort of have that um, ability to laser in on whatever is holding someone back and sort of help them see an entirely new world. So um, I'm excited to be here and I love reaching new audiences and different demographics because I feel as human beings, we all have fundamentally the same constraints at the subconscious level that are holding us back from living a life of our dreams and fulfilling on our potential. So I've yet to meet anyone who wouldn't want to access more of that. So I'm happy to be here. Um, even my wife's happy to have you here. So she was at um, <laughs> Dave Asprey's uh, biohacking conference in Dallas here a couple of months back. And yep. she was at your Thursday session. And she said that, on, I think she went to your Saturday session and you said, was anybody here on Thursday? Because if you were, you can go home now. It, it, <laughs> you know, I, I not only talk in front of crowds of people, a lot of times I'm talking like at a horse expo in front of crowds of people while working with an anxious horse. Yes. And every once in a while, the magic happens to where like, that was the perfect, the perfect session. Had a beginning, mm-hmm. a middle, and end. It all came out right, and it sounds like your Thursday session at the at Dave Asprey's thing was 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 that session. Yeah, they were both really powerful. It was, I think, because Thursday was sold out, and the people were upset that they couldn't get into the room, and so I actually spoke again on Saturday, and they ended up being incredibly moving, both for me and the attendees. And um, there's something about doing live events that really. I think for you, you can probably attest to this, but I know for myself, it pulls a different layer out of me. You know, like I, I, as much as I love to go deep and help people really heal some oftentimes very, very old suffering that they've been carrying around for a long time, which is incredibly liberating. I I guess at some level, I might be a bit of a natural entertainer too, because I like to bring a lot of comedy and, and the way that I get to interact with real humans, um, in a live environment is, uh, yeah, it's just, it's very inspiring for me to, and then to have a long line of people who want to come up and say thank you or hug or take a photo. There's, there's just something beautiful about that dynamic of actually being with people. So I'm glad your wife enjoyed it. And, um, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd give myself a pretty high score for both of those events. <laughs> yeah. Cause it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, I don't think it always works out that way. Sometimes you're like, Oh, it's really on. And maybe you're on all the time, but Sometimes like, yeah, that was perfect. But I really feel a lot of it has to do with the the exchange of energy with the people in the room, you know, the, the energy that they bring and it's yeah. just, yeah. For sure. And, and that's where I take pride and I certainly wasn't always like this, but I I've, I feel like now whenever I do live events, I don't really prepare anything. Um, people are like, how like how are you so so powerfully succinct and the stuff you drop it's like mic drops all over the place and I I think that really is by virtue of the fact that I'm just present with the people right if I go in there with this pre um 
conceived script of what I want to say or try and capture some of my brilliant anecdotes or quotes and you know it just sort of comes from a different place so both of those events in Dallas uh, the one that your wife attended to and then the Saturday yeah I obviously have a couple of maybe two bullet points of what I want to speak to as a theme but then I like I like the natural unfolding of what actually transpires in a room with humans. I've done two live events recently, and now we're going to be doing monthly live events because they've gone so well. Um, we sold out within 24 hours, and we need a bigger space already. And it's in both on both occasions, it was the same thing. You know, I sat there, I spoke maybe for 10 minutes, and then I just let it flow with the people because humans are sitting there. It's like everyone's coming into the room with something, right? Humans are carrying something and normally a lot of some things like plural, right? So I like to hear what, you know, it's like being a good friend. It's like, hey, what's going on with you? Tell me, you know? And so even though that might seem like a, a tough dynamic to fulfill on when it's a group of hundreds of people versus just sitting one-on-one -on -one with a friend in the kitchen and you can really hear them, I, I still feel energetically I'm able to afford people that sense of, safety that, that there's someone here who actually cares and gives a shit you know and they, they feel safe to speak up and then from there the conversation just unflows be uh, unfolds beautifully mm. do you do you ever feel like sometimes you're you're i don't know if the word's channeling or downloading but do you do you ever find that when you're speaking to groups of people like that an idea that you've talked about a lot before will come out in a different way sometimes even on a deeper level than you understood it before have you ever had that? 100 percent, 100 percent. i mean when i do my mastermind a three-month container my most powerful offering and in fact even on a podcast but certainly when i'm within the container of my own company right because the podcast um arena i've done hundreds but my mastermind is my team is monitoring they're recording it's you know people that have signed up and paid to be with me and i'll often say something and i'll say afterwards i couldn't have said that any better would someone on my team make sure we capture that <laughs> so um yes there's definitely those moments um that i I'm equally the beneficiary of whatever it is that I'm saying, because it may be, you know, a tenant that I've spoken to before, but with a subtly different distinction that for whatever reason carries a lot more profundity with it. Yeah. Yeah. It takes it to that next level. Um, yeah. So Peter, can you, for our listeners, I would have done an intro before we come on here, but do you want to tell us pretty succinctly <clears throat> what exactly is it you do? I can try. <laughs> um, I think, as they say, necessity being the mother of invention, you know, I came up with the moniker, the mind architect, um, because I'd been called a spiritual teacher, a happiness guru, a performance coach, even a hitman for the ego, which was cute. But uh, I, um, I, yeah, so I, I, I'll give you, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the vision statement for my company and that will sort of be the catch all. I say, you know, I'm here to inspire the realization of a new type of human being. And what that means is to move from the current paradigm that we live in, which tends to be based in limitation, fear, suffering and disease. That's the world that we have based on the mindset that people look through. And what I introduce people to is the world of freedom, love, possibility and vitality. Uh, which is the world on the other side of the constraints of our subconscious. So that's a very highfalutin poetic way of saying I help people get out of their own way, end their suffering, and start living a life that they totally love. Well, you're in the right place because a lot of times I'll tell people that this podcast is about, you know, chatting with very interesting people like yourself and figuring out how they rose above the cultural and societal conditioning that we all that we all get and you've you've risen a long i i feel like a long way like you have a like i said before an outlook that's very very succinct and it i kind of want to dig into where it all comes from but do you want to share p uh, with people a bit of your story first because you have you have quite uh you know you've had a traumatic childhood you've had some terrible things happen and that's got to be part of how you ended up where you ended up but do you want to do you want to give us the the cliff notes on uh, at least up till coming to america and, and being in america then i want to take it from there but 
you can sure really absolutely no i appreciate the invitation to share um yeah i mean i had a unique childhood in as much as i was an only child but i was orphaned by 17 which is pretty young so my mum had been very sick from when i was about late four to five years old and she passed when i was seven of bone cancer which was obviously very trying and i continue to look at the ways that that impacted me because obviously as a seven-year-old we don't have the wherewithal to process or cope with something that traumatic and i certainly lived for a long time with a very deep fear of loss when it came to the feminine right meaning as i got older i started to date or fell in love with somebody um representing that mother figure you know there was a lot of fear around losing that partner and then i think more traumatically because then it was just me and my dad 10 years later when i was 17 my dad worked on the ferries that go between england and belgium and england and france and there was a major shipping disaster where the boat that he worked on he was the senior chief engineer uh it capsized uh, actually within the harbor and uh, close to a couple of hundred people died and it was you know all over the news for days as they're trying to recover and retrieve bodies um, from the boat and sadly he was one that didn't make it so you know that I think it obviously compounded the fear of loss it also compounded the fear of being alone um, but to have my dad who was my everything and vice versa because I was his only son and obviously he had lost his wife who he loved um, you know for him to just as he did say I love you and go to work and I'll see you tomorrow and never came back ever you know that was that was very very difficult and i can certainly remember sitting in or standing in my room once uh, a couple of days after that and having this visceral experience of being completely alone you know and i think in ways that certainly at the time i didn't comprehend it really forged um what is now my career i guess where i i had just an immense amount of compassion for how much human beings suffer and oftentimes they're in a relationship they're married they have kids their parents might still be alive but by virtue of the design of the ego which is this separate entity you know i had the visceral experience of being alone but the ego feels alone so it's almost like i went to the depths of despair of a loneliness that most people feel even when they're surrounded by family and so it just allows me to understand that even if a wife or a husband are married, but they don't feel seen, they don't feel heard, they don't feel held uh, as an extension of whatever their subconscious constraints and limitations are of their ego, that they're not loved, they're not good enough, they're not wanted, you know. So yeah, that was that was my introduction to this particular life cycle that I'm in. <laughs> was a bit of a bit of a blow, but I I, I still feel ultimately like the luckiest man alive for the gift that I have to be able to help people and suffering oftentimes literally saved their life i had a post on my instagram recently it's just gone ban bananas it's got over three million views which for me is a big deal and the comments it's about suicidal ideation and helping people to reframe as you said my ability to shift perspective about when people want to die it's not that they want to die it's just a part of them that is asking to die that's been suffocating them and to see people's comments it's really moving i mean some people have literally said this watching this video just literally saved my life you mm -hmm. know so so i do feel fortunate that i get to do that and also that i even have a short lived my time was with my parents obviously my mum very short but with my dad i couldn't have asked for a better dad he adored me so i i often say that i might have only had my father for 17 years but i got to experience truly what love is and i know friends of mine whose father they might have had for 70 years and they've never really felt that so yeah we, we all have our cross to bear and it's always appropriate for whatever karma we're here to transcend so that's my story it doesn't make me any special than uh, any more special than anyone else but it I think it does allow me to have an immense amount of compassion for humans and how hard life can be sometimes but don't you feel even that that sharing that perspective helps a lot of people to where if you think about you you know if you, if you think about from the perspective of you chose this life and and all the traumas were here to help you become who you're supposed to be they're not bad things that happened you know that's i think yeah. that's a perspective change that you know i spent a long time not being aware of um yeah. 
and so you know i think just in in the telling of that story and the way you phrased it at the end there that's a big could be a big learning curve for for some listeners i hope so i i'm i'm reminded of when i first went to college in the uk to university and the very first break you know it was christmas after we start in um the fall or, or, or autumn and or uh, september august or whatever and i you know like anyone go to university didn't know anyone and make friends and so by the time it came for the holidays um one of my friends said to me he said oh, are you going home for the holidays i said um no i'm gonna probably go um skiing and he's like well you, d you don't spend your time with your family and i said i don't have family and i'll never forget his face you know it just was like aghast at like well what do you mean you don't have family i said well i was an only child and my parents passed and he said holy shit like he said if if we lined up all fifteen thousand students at the time at the university and i was asked to pick who didn't have any parents he said you'd probably be the last one i would pick because you just you know for him I think the the disconnect was that I was one of the most positive, happy people he knew, you know, and I guess he had collapsed that with stability of family or loved ones. And it was very moving. And so I appreciate you saying the same that, yeah, I, I think life is, is really how we see it. <laughs> you know, it's like Milton, an English playwright, he said, you know, the mind is a place within itself and can make heaven of hell or hell of heaven. Right. So wherever you go, there you are, and you're going to see the way you want to see. And oftentimes it's not even the way you want to. It's just the conditioning of how your brain has been wired to survive. And so I'm not by any stretch of the imagination saying I've always been this free or had this ability to so graciously go through life, even with my own ups and downs today. But I just do feel that being human is a gift. Being human is an opportunity. And no matter how short lived some of our experiences are with people, especially those that we love or that extend love to us, that's something to be grateful for. And um, so that's where I feel so many people are sadly, you know, unbeknownst to themselves, victims of life. They think everything is happening to them. And uh, one of my more popular quotes that gets pumped around social media is I say, life will present you with people and circumstances to reveal where you're not free, right? And so when you look at it through that lens, it's like, oh, this is the sort of three-dimensional training ground where <laughs> the universe has set up exactly, you know, the events curated for my own liberation. And so that's where I feel very blessed that albeit some of those lessons that life has given me have been <laughs> a pain in the ass, you know, they're they're nonetheless what has allowed me to discover true freedom, which I assert is why we're here because that's our inherent nature so that's the way i look at it <laughs> that that quote uh when you said that again that's the first quote i that's when i first discovered you i don't know how many years ago now i don't know how many years you've been doing the rounds in social media but i saw that quote life will present you with people and circumstances to real reveal where you are not free yeah and i was like well i remember i maybe took a screenshot of it or something, text it to a friend of mine and said, listen to this shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's a big one. Yeah. So, yeah. How, you know, <clears throat> your friend wouldn't have picked you out of 15,000 people to be the, to be the orphaned kid. What, what do you think it was that allowed you to have that perspective even way back then? I mean, this is your first year in uni. So what are you? 18? 19. Yeah, I had a skipper. Yeah, they, they rejected me three times. So that was another story in of itself of my own tenacity and commitment that I managed to eventually commit, uh, convince them to let me in. And, and it was a beautiful story. If I can toot my horn for a second, I got rejected three times in the first year, once in the second year until I just actually called the uni and spoke to someone in the department, pleaded my case. You know, my dad had died, didn't get the grades I was expected. And uh, three years later, when I graduated, I got the most... Uh, um revered prize that they give to any student you know it was uh it's called the sir martin robert prize sir robert martin prize for uh the student of uh, all around the most outstanding student of all around achievement so it was you know just not academics but contribution to the university and so that was for me a very yeah just a beautiful 
moment of pride, you know, that in, in a, despite all the adversity, I could have easily acquiesced. There were other universities that wanted me. I could have given in and, you know, rationalized why I didn't get accepted because my dad died during my A-levels in my final year at high school. And I wouldn't have got the, I didn't get the grades that I was supposed to go to Oxford or Cambridge or whatever. And so anyway, that, that, I just want to throw that in there because uh, that was a very nice moment for me to, I don't I honestly don't know what possessed me as an 18, 19 year old to pick up a phone, which back then was on the wall and you had to, you know, do the rotary <laughs> sort of giving away my age. But um, yeah, that was, I'm very proud of that 18, 19 year old that he had the wherewithal and the courage to do that. Yeah. So, do you, you know, is that, is that like nature versus nurture sort of thing? Like, you know, like I said, your friend from outward perspective, you're the happiest guy on campus sort of thing. You would not be the one of the 15,000 to have been orphaned a, a few years ago. Yeah. Do you think that's how you were wired or were you doing a lot of introspective, deep stuff back then? I think it's both, right? I think it's nature and nurture. You know, you got big topics out there now with longevity studies and epigenetics and realizing that we're not victims of our genes, right? But actually based on mindset, diet, lifestyle, we can turn on and off certain proteins to extend, you know, the quality of our life and the quantity of our life. So I think it's both, right? I think I've been gifted with whatever my genetic makeup. And if you get into astrology, you know, and people talk about I've got Mercury and Jupiter in the first house, which is the communicator and the teacher and the guru and you know, so there were certain things there that allowed me to have a very unique um, outlook on life. And I think that coupled with really understanding the, I would say, albeit unspoken, the intentionality of what my dad would have wanted me for my life, you know, like it wasn't, I'm was so young, he didn't know he was going to go to work, he was 48, you know, and that he was going to die. Um, so we'd never really had that heart to heart, man to man. I, I was still 17. I wasn't even a man. And I was arguably a, a, a much more sensitive boy than most. And so um, there was no time to talk about my aspirations as a kid. I, he just adored me. So I think it's sort of that unconscious understanding of who he would have wanted me to be in his absence, right? So I think that was a driving component too, that... Um, he, he just adored me. I, I was acknowledged so often by my dad. I was a very, very prolific uh, soccer player, footy player, you know, and did incredible things. I even got picked up by a professional UK team to go into their development program when I was very young. And sadly, that fell apart. I went to a traditional English school with Saturday morning schools. And so I had to drop it eventually. But, you know, he, he would take paper clippings of everything that I accomplished. And so I think that that sense of belief in me um, just naturally got extended mm. as the way that I wanted to fulfill on my life as part of my legacy to him. Well, you mentioned astrologers a minute ago. Have you ever had an astrologer do a reading on you that, uh, I mean, it's be hard now because you're Peter Crone, everybody knows who you are, but, but earlier on, <laughs> did you ever have somebody kind of tell you what your purpose is here and you didn't even know it at the time? And at the time when they told you, it was like, um, I think early on when I, I've, I've always loved these sort of more subtler, softer sciences, you know, that people sometimes can dismiss or poo poo. But, um, you know, I studied Ayurveda for 20 years and, you know, the allopathic world would probably just scoff at that. Um, yet it's 5,000 years old and makes the allopathic medicine look like child's play. You know, it's right. like one of the, I think the third leading, leading cause of death is, is medicine, right? It's crazy. Um, so yes, I think there were times where there were things that an astrologer would say to me, which of course, when you're a human, you want to hear these aspirational, wonderful future sort of fulfillments that you're working towards. I think when you're not in that place, it's hard to comprehend. I, I think for me, it's been more the natural progression of my life that has been the astonishing part, like that. When I was 26, I mean, even coming to the States in 23 or whatever it was like, you know, meaning I'm 23, 24 years old, you know, I would have never thought that. And then at 26, I get hired by Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman to be their trainer. Like these are things that I could never have predicted. So there have been certain predictions, you know, that um, an astrologer has shared with me about my future. 
And I actually had a reading not that long ago with someone probably like six, eight weeks ago. And what he's predicting is, is, is pretty astonishing. And, you know, I'm not going to get ahead of myself, but it all seems very wonderful. But uh, the one thing I'm always left with with astrologers is they always seem to be telling you great about this great stuff, but it's always in the future. <laughs> I'm like, can, I, can I just have some great stuff right now? <laughs> Of course, tongue in cheek, because I feel very blessed. But yeah, so there, there were there were some that would say, but without too many specifics, you know, but there were often times someone who'd say, you know, you're going to have a big presence in the public eye and that you make a big difference. And I think deep down, there was a there was probably a knowing of that, even without necessarily uh, fully comprehending what it looks like. Can I ask you about that? How have you have you ever struggled with that? Like the like the enormity of the difference that you're making? Um, that's a beautiful question. I, I haven't struggled with it. Um, and it's becoming, I guess, increasingly evident, like the, the, the number of people that stopped me and even there it looked like you were kind of moved a bit. Um, mm -hmm. But the number of people that come up to me in tears and like, I mean, I was... I was just in Cancun. I'm friends with uh, Joe Dispenza. We did a movie together called Heal, and he invited me to come to one of his retreats. And I remember the first morning I was sitting down having breakfast, and this this older gentleman, not old, old, but like I'd say late 50s, he walked past me, and he said, oh my gosh, you look just like Peter Crone. <laughs> I said, I get that a lot. Um, <laughs> and I said, that's because I am. And he just burst into tears. You know, this is an old man, like, and not an old man, but I mean, a, a man, right? Like he's not a child. And he said, you have no idea how you've changed my life and probably saved my marriage. And I've had a number of people stop me in grocery stores and they're like, you literally saved my life, you know? So I don't think it's, it doesn't phase me. It just brings that much more humility and it brings an immense amount of gratitude that I'm somebody who, for whatever reasons, have been gifted the ability to use words. And I'd say behind that, obviously, more the energy of actually really caring and being a very loving human who genuinely wants to help others and listen and hear them and see them. Um, it just, yeah, it just makes me feel incredibly fulfilled and fortunate. So, I don't take it on like it's my responsibility. Clearly, there's 8 billion people out there, and I'd love to reach as many as I can, but I can't be held accountable for their lives. Everyone's got their karma. But I do feel I have the opportunity to perhaps, again, going back to how we started, shift perspective that could be the difference maker in the type of life they have and even keeping the life they have, you know? Right. You uh, you mentioned the Heal documentary before. I had here a couple of months ago, had Adam Shermer on the podcast. Okay, cool. He was uh, he was a very cool dude. Yeah, he is. He's a great guy. <laughs> great guy. So you mentioned the whole Tom and Nicole thing mm. before. So and yeah. I, want, I want to kind of get that bit out of the way before we go further. But from the bit that I know of you in your off time at uni in England, you would come to the somewhere on the east coast of america coach yep soccer tennis something? tennis tennis yeah tennis. as a tennis coach for a kids camp in upstate new york yeah it was fun i did two consecutive summers yeah and then what some bloke you met there later on said hey why don't you come to america is that is that how that came down kind of yeah so um as is typically the case in these camps you know they do a little bit of recruiting overseas because it's sort of they pay in peanuts just because it's the novelty of i'd never been to america they pay your flight and I think I got 50 bucks a month or something. Um, but it was such a fun experience. And then they have some locals who, um, so one of my friends that I, you know, got to know was a, um, he was from Long Island and he had a beautiful family. I actually visited with them after the camp and traveled around a bit with my, my, uh, rucksack, my backpack. And, um, he then moved to California. Uh, he always had the dreams of becoming uh, a film producer, getting involved in the whole world of Hollywood and Hollywood or whatever. And so I went to um, uh, back to the UK. I was finishing my master's at the time. And then I had actually scheduled to travel around the world with a good friend of mine. And we were going to go to multiple countries and do the whole thing. And he was the world's greatest procrastinator. So I'd finished my thesis and he was nowhere near. So I said, look, while you 
you know, twiddle your thumbs or whatever you're doing over there. I'm going to go and visit this friend of mine in California. And so that's what brought me to the West Coast and um, kind of never left. I mean, I did leave California, but I, I um, yeah, we I stayed there for a long time. We, we made a terrible low budget movie together. Me, his uh, roommate from uh, university or college that he went to. So the three of us were these three aspiring entrepreneurial 24 year olds who didn't know what the hell they were doing but we made a full-length feature which was a great experience uh, not didn't financially work out <laughs> but it definitely taught us a lot about you know working with a big team and and uh, the very corrupt industry of making movies <laughs> what was it a documentary no it was a full-length feature oh really? yeah yeah it's terrible <laughs> isn't yeah. it isn't it funny like where where you've ended up if you think about it part of it was because you said i talk to people a lot about saying yes to opportunities and you said yes to the opportunity to go to the east coast of america to work for peanuts yeah. in a summer camp and it's because the guy you met there and he had this dream of going to hollywood and you get there and then uh you end up working it as a were well, your personal trainer in the gym is that what it was? That's how you yep. met with yeah. So no, it's beautiful, and I, I often reflect on that, and I'm glad that you do, and you you brought it up. It's like you sort of see these, um, I think the movie Sliding Door moments, right? Like you know where you see the two different potential paths that we could have gone down, and of course, there's always more than two. But again, I, without sounding too philosophical, point out that you couldn't have a different life, right? Like it's only the assumption or the imagination of a different life. You, we always have the life we have. Um, so it does seem like yes these these sort of cookie trail moments of one thing leads to the next and that's why i go back to saying i feel like i am the luckiest man alive that life seems to curate these events not saying they're easy but that somehow do um pull me forward into a better version of myself at every turn and that i do tend to rise to the challenge um and that i did take the risk you know like you know they say playing it safe is the riskiest way to live and i certainly i think perhaps again in ways that i didn't understand becoming orphaned gave me that passport to freedom that would probably not have been the case if certainly even if it was just my dad because i adored him so much and our bond was so tight in the absence of my mother that i like many children would have probably been stuck in my own head about what does my dad want me to do you know the the child that really wants to fulfill on the the wishes of the parents. And so in a bizarre way, you know, I was really set free by them and whatever our soul contract was between the three of us that my journey was really into that main product to talk about, which was freedom. And um, so I was able to explore and go to the East Coast and then the West Coast. And, you know, I do, I do feel very fortunate for the way that things show up and the gym in and uh, LA was one of those random moments where I was after the film I was broke I, I mean I think I arrived in the states with about 250 bucks in, in my bank I slept on a carpet it was a shitty carpet stained and didn't smell very good in a rent control apartment you know and that was my life and then after we made the film I had to get a job so I worked in a bar on the beach uh, which was fun but certainly not necessarily a good career path um, so um, I can remember being in my apartment building and one of my, um, the, the other tenants who lived, uh, on the floor above, he, he came up to me one day and he said, you know, what, do you have any like interest in maybe being a trainer? He said, you know, you're shredded, you're in great shape. And we, we talked enough that he knew my background at college was human biology and exercise physiology. I said, yeah, that would be cool. And he said, well, if you get qualified, you know, in a certification, I can hire you because I'm the manager of all the trainers at this particular gym. So that was, again, one of those fortuitous moments. And so I got the job. And then within six, five months, the general manager of the actual gym came up to me one day and said, I've got two new clients for you, which at the time was nothing unusual. I was the hardest worker. I mean, that was the joke amongst all the trainers. I was sleeping at the gym because I would be the first one there and the last to leave. And um, I actually found my journal from my appointments with clients and it blew me away. I had 13 clients a day, quite often, like three or four days a week. That's 13 hours of training, you know, and I had to eat and, you know, use the restroom sometimes <laughs> between that. So I, I don't know what possessed me. I didn't even have a car. I was riding a bike and it wasn't even my bike. I was borrowing someone's push bike to get to the gym. 
So anyway, this again, fortuitous day that GM came up to me and said, we've got two new clients. I was like, okay, sure. Cause I was just, you know, bringing them on all the time. And she said, well, they're very special clients and they're Bob's clients. And everyone knew Bob was Tom Cruise's trainer. So at that point the penny dropped and, you know, it wasn't, didn't mean I got the job. They were, they were recruiting or interviewing other people, but sort of intuitively I, I felt confident that I'd get it, even though it took four interviews before I even got to Tom. But yeah, then that led to the next five years of my life, which was really extraordinary experience. So an interview I've heard, you said you traveled around the world with them while he was doing all the Mission Impossible. Is that right? Yeah, he did. I mean, he's done tons, but certainly at the beginning of that and Nicole was doing Moulin Rouge and yeah, we did a whole bunch of movies. We did Eyes Wide Shut with Stanley Kubrick in London and yeah, it was great. I bet there's this, yeah, there's, that's another whole lot of stories. Okay, so, <laughs> yeah, so the, the thing I want to know is, okay, you've got a degree in exercise physiology and, and what was the other part? Human biology. Human biology. Okay, you got that bit. You're a personal trainer in a gym. Now you're a personal trainer for Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. Yeah. Fast forward, you are now the mind architect. And you have, like I said before, you have a perspective like not many people. Yeah. Where did that come from? Like how did you go from the the outside <laughs> to the inside? Is yeah. That's my big question, really. That's a beautiful question. Um, I think like anything, it's accumulative, right? As I said, even going back to my mum passing when I'm seven, to what degree did that contribute to the start of this journey that I couldn't see was being curated for me or was starting to mold me? Um, the the big quote unquote obvious event was um, actually I fell in love with this woman when I was in Australia, when we were shooting Moulin, Moulin Rouge and uh, two of the Mission Impossibles. And um, it was the first time, for me at least, that it was what I knew to the best of my ability as a ripe old 29-year-old or whatever, 28-year-old, what love was, right? I mean, subsequently, my understanding of love has become immensely more evolved. But, you know, for me at the time, it was the be-all, end-all, and she was it. And um, without going into every uh, intricate detail about how we met and what transpired, she eventually came around and, you know, fell in love with me and she moved with me to LA and, um, we were together for about a year and a half and then she left and it was in the leaving that I got to have this, what they call in Buddhism, Sartori or awakening moment, right? Where, it took a while. Uh, she left. She her, her phrase to me is like, I've got to go. And I was like, why? She said, your love is suffocating. Mm. <laughs> and I was like, well, wait, that's sort of oxymoronic. That doesn't sound too bad. Like, you know, there's so much love, but it's suffocating. So I didn't fully understand at the time, but it actually became uh, evident as I did the work. So she left and um, I was just really struggled. I fell apart and all of my deep, deep, deep fears of loss came to the surface, you know, which you don't have to be a rocket scientist to recognize that came from mum and dad dying. And I'd never really, um, you know, trans transcended those or transmuted them. And so she was the, you know, people and circumstance being presented to me to see where I wasn't free. And so she left, I fell apart, called every friend I had under the sun, desperate men doing desperate things, trying to figure out how to get her back and all of that. And, um, and then about seven, eight weeks after that, I can remember my mind just wouldn't shut up. I was just, uh, you know, I got high IQ, EQ. And so there's this constant rumination and iterating on all of the different scenarios of what could be, should be, and what should, what would someone else do? And how do I get it back and all of that? And there were these, I'd say there were four incessant questions. One was, where is she? Will I see her again? Um, is she dating someone else? And will I find love like that again? And they just were incessant persistent questions that just kept me up at night, sometimes quite literally, where I, I remember one night waking up and just shouting to my own mind to shut up. <laughs> it was apparently certifiable back then. But anyway, um, and then one day in this, you know, famed rent control apartment, I got the answer to all the questions, you know, where is she? Is she dating someone? Will I see her again? And will I have love like that again? And it was just three words. I don't know. And and. I mean, even as I say it now, like the the feeling of relief that cascaded through every cell in my body was like something I've never ever experienced. 
And in that same moment, I realized that the very nature of life itself is uncertainty. And we've never known. We're under the impression that we have a good idea. And certainly the, the smarter we get, the better we get at predictions or speculations. But um, I realized the truth is that life is uncertain. And yet as a human being, by virtue of the brain's preoccupation with survival, it's always trying to predict and protect to keep us alive. And so that rumination of always trying to figure it out was really just me trying to survive the deep, deep hurt of loss, right? And which was only perpetuating it and sustaining it. And so at that moment, I let go of all of that. And what was so, in for me, in insanely powerful is within 15 minutes, she called me on the phone. I haven't spoken to her for like seven weeks. And now she's crying, which is what I wanted to hear for the first week or two that we were still in touch after she left, you know, saying, I miss you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I just really got entanglement theory in that moment. Oh my like, god! Like you let yeah. you let go of all that, and she called. There was no more holding. It made her, it made space for her to show up. Like, <sighs> and and this is a crazy part. I was in LA at the time. She was in fucking New Zealand. I don't even know how she got there, but she was literally on the other side of the world. She couldn't be further away, and yet the interconnectedness of something and everything in my releasing of the holding of the desperate trying to get her, there was space and freedom for her to come to me or to show up. So as I shifted, you know, she shifted mm -hmm. in ways that she obviously wasn't consciously aware. She was just inspired for whatever reasons to call. And um, yeah, so from that moment forth, you know, we could say I, I saw the matrix. And um, of course, there's been countless other shifts and refinements of my own understanding of life, the brain, human behavior, psychology, trauma, how it impacts coping strategies and survival strategies that we all develop. And, um, but that was, that was the start of my new career. Cause I just, I was literally a completely different human being. I almost had like an Eckhart Tolle moment. Sort yeah. Of. Very much, um, very much my version. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's <laughs> super cool. You know, if you guys at home, just, I'm always, especially helping people with their horses. Step one is you've got to be able to give up control. And mm -hmm. that there was about giving, you gave up control and the thing that you mm -hmm. wanted to happen, happened. But you didn't give up control so it would happen. And I, for me, yeah. I've learned a lot of lessons through life, not because I knew the answer to the thing. I did a thing, you know, cause and effect gave up control, the thing you want to happen then happens and you're like, oh, but it wasn't like you knew the answer. You didn't give up control because you, you read somewhere, if I give up control, I'll get what I want. Right. No, it's much more profound and for whatever it's worth, just maybe to shift the needle a little bit for your audience. You know, if you understand the mechanism of trying to control, right? Like it's not that we're giving up control, we're giving up the us that feels the need to control. Right, control is a behavioral adaptation to really who who are we, the I that we are misidentified with that thinks it needs to control. And you look beneath the curtain of that, you see that it's fear. Right? Because control is a byproduct of living in fear, fear being the experience of the individual who doesn't understand that they're connected to life and that you're held. Right. So when we're looking through the lens of separation, which is what I spoke to earlier, the idea that this ego, this identity that we're misassociated with is trying to survive, then yes, you need to control because you're under the illusion that it's up to me and that I'm this isolated separate unit that has to try and can, uh, control the, the external environment so that my needs are met all of which is all reinforcing that I'm not part of the whole, my needs aren't naturally met and that I'm not loved, held and seen which is the lie. So as soon as you let go of the lie, then life can reorient itself to the fact that you're now part of it as opposed to separate to it. That's one of those, hang on, Peter, I got to stop and stare at the wall for a minute. That was a great <laughs> distinction from what I said to what you said. That was about control. Yeah, it's deep, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you're yeah. a deep dude. Don't fuck around here, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a question. You said something a minute ago, because you know, I've got shit. Um, you said something <laughs> about, oh, I've got high IQ and high EQ, so of course my mind does blah blah. 
blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. I have a high IQ. Yeah. Are those related? Like the high IQ and the rumination, are they? Are those two connected? Completely. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I love quotes, as you know. So with people who high IQs, which tends to be all of my C-suite executives and business owners and even some of my athletes, but, you know, say so being smart doesn't make you happier. It just makes your reasons why you're not way more convincing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that stings a bit, doesn't it? Yeah. So what happens is when you have the high intelligence, your brain is able to curate, articulate justifications and rationale for why life isn't the way you want it. So it's the same as somebody who maybe doesn't have the same intelligence or the wherewithal, but they're just, you know, very, they're using very blunt or mundane excuses for why their life isn't working. But the more intelligence we have, the more that we can pull from a fancy lexicon, a bigger vocabulary, and the life experiences that we've typically had, if we're intelligent, you know, it just makes our rationale so much more um, justified. And somebody who can't listen acutely or discern or cut apart somebody's reasons, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, no, you, you got a good point. So then you sustain and perpetuate your own misery. So that's why I love working with really, really smart people because they don't have, they don't typically have somebody around them who can cut through the BS and realize that it's just their mind's way, very slippery, right? The ego will do whatever it can to be right. You know, again, one of my quotes, I say, being right is the poor man's version of self-worth. So the ego is always trying to find evidence for its own existence because fundamentally it's fictitious. So you have to find, you know, the reasons as to why you can be right that you're not good enough or that your life sucks or that no one loves you. It's like, see here, here's, here's, um, uh, what do they say in the courtroom? Here's exhibit a <laughs> for why, for why I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> it's like, okay, congratulations. You got to be right about something that's fundamentally a lie. Cause you know, your mom or dad said something when you're six and you still believe it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad you said that, that last bit there, I think a lot of people, and I was this way for a long time, that, you know, you talk quite a bit about the subconscious, that I had this subconscious loop that flew below the radar that I was a piece of shit. Yeah. 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 That's a tough one to live in. That's a tough world. Obviously, it moved you right there, just even declaring it. Yeah. And you get to the point i think i mean for me the first part is being aware that it's there yeah and i think that's when the the um i don't know the journey to healing kind of starts there you, the, you know having that awareness of that that's what's going on mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's like carl jung you know he says until the unconscious is made conscious it will drive your life and you'll call it fate mm. Yeah, so awareness to me is the first step, bringing that which we are oblivious to, but is the pattern that fundamentally drives our life so we can see it, which just like for you there, isn't always comfortable because invariably, you know, whatever that constraint is that we're stuck in is it's not the most flattering view that we could have of ourselves, you know? And so when you look at it, it hurts because it is collapsed with a lot of pain from childhood. Like what was it like for that little boy that you were to feel like he's a piece of shit? That's that tells us volumes about what your childhood was like, right? Like not all the time, but those moments of isolation, of feeling discarded, of feeling dismissed, of feeling that you're worthless and that you can't do anything right. When that, when that is a child's experience, it's devastating. It's devastating for that child, which we can see in your eyes, right? So um, I'm sorry that you went through that, but for whatever reasons, that's what you signed up for, mate, so that you could see the truth on the other side, which is, no, I'm a divine expression of all possibilities. I'm pure love. I am freedom. And uh, you're clearly a big contribution to the world. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's that. There was a quote of yours I wrote down before, and I was just thinking about getting to it before we all went into that bit. But it was a quote about overreading, but I think it's related to anything. Mm -hmm. And your quote about overreading said, who you are is an expression of pure love and pure possibility working through a lens of inadequacy, insecurity, and scarcity, which led to a behavioral adaptation 
or you found comfort in food. That food could be anything, couldn't it? Yeah. Sex, yeah. drugs, rock and roll. Pick your, yeah. pick your substance of mm. choice. Yeah. Yeah. The lens of inadequacy, insecurity, and scarcity, which led yeah. to a behavioral adaptation. Yeah. And so I, I think, you know, for me, the point I was trying to make then was I was 50, four, even uh, probably 48, maybe, before I even started to become aware of that. you know, that subconscious programming circulating there. So, mm -hmm. you know, the reason I was mentioning that is because some people like me for a long time didn't even know it was there. So you, you, you live your life with a level of uh, unease or whatever, but it's not, yeah. it's not terrible, but there's, you know, there's this thing below the surface. And then when it comes to the surface, then the, I think that's when the, that's when the hard work begins. 100%. Yeah, we can call that functional anxiety. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are, who are making it, you know, most people are just surviving. And we don't know what we don't know in terms of the again, the quote I use, I say, there's a language we use, and there's a language that uses us, right? So meaning, we're using English. <laughs> but the language that's been using you has been I'm a piece of shit, right? Like, and we can expand on that, like, I'm worthless, nobody wants me, I'm not loved, I'm not, not, you know, not enough, there's a whole suite of bedfellows that go with that and when you live inside of that that language is going to use you right the way that you feel the kind of relationships you've picked the way that you speak about yourself in public the choices you make in terms of your own health and what you do or don't do to take care of yourself you know it defines everything i mean i was just working in my live event that i just did with a woman who she realized i helped her see one of her main prisons was that her, her needs aren't met or that she doesn't matter and so she was sadly sexually abused when she was a gymnast and young. And now she's a stunt woman who's in constant pain, but she'll always say, no, it's okay. I'm fine. We can do one more take. So she was just crying, but realizing how appro appropriate, you know, for her quote unquote mindset that she's now a stunt woman who gets beat to shit, which is an extension of the fact that she doesn't matter. You know, and it was just staggering for her to see, holy shit, now as a grown woman, I continue to live in that world. And that's what everybody does. You know, the quintessential people pleaser or perfectionist, that is a coping strategy for some feeling of I'm not good enough, right? And so we actually, unbeknownst to ourselves, and it's all innocent because it's blind, we create our personalities and then the by extension, our life, you know, our personality, our personality gives rise to our personal reality, right? It's just that extension. And when you see that, it's, it's huge. It's huge to see, holy shit, like I've done this for 30, 40, 50 years based on a lie that got created at a very trying time when I was a kid through no fault of anybody. It's not, you know, it doesn't help to point fingers at parents. That's the blame game. I'm still a victim. But really to see that was my life that I curated and that for whatever reasons I decided in this lifetime, in your case, to think I'm a piece of shit. Why did I choose that journey? Well, Maybe, you know, if I could offer a perspective, it would be to realize, no, actually, you're extraordinary and you're a divine extension of the whole and your nature is pure love, you know, but perhaps from the soul level, you'd forgotten that. So it's like, well, we're going to give you the game called you're going to think and pretend that you're a piece of shit until you realize you're not. <laughs> mm. you know, it's, a, it's a crazy but beautiful and at times really challenging experience to be human but that to me is the ultimate the ultimate game of being human is not about amassing more money more followers more power more possessions it's about breaking free from the constraints with which we arrived that's that's the opportunity to be human that's another one of those peter crone peter crone quotes yeah um <laughs> i just i'm just blown away by your perspective i always am but um, well, thank you, mate. Appreciate it. What, what, so, you know, you had this, let's call it the Eckhart Tolle moment. Uh, you know, you had this moment earlier on. What other things would you say have been big influences on your perspective? Well, for instance, one of the questions I'll often ask podcast guests is, is there a book you recommend a lot? Not, mm -hmm. not necessarily your favorite book to read, but one that you recommend uh to others is there a, is do you have one of those i have many i think that was 
you know, pivotal for me when I started to have this shift in perspective. Um, I first got into the work of Krishnamurti. And um, I can remember I was with a girlfriend in Paris. We were living there. She was American. I'd already come to the States, but then she wanted to study at the Sorbonne. And so I went with her. And I can remember, you know, reading a book of his called Total Freedom. And I, can, I literally remember lying in bed reading and going, fuck, finally someone knows what the hell I'm talking about, right? It wasn't so much he was... It wasn't a book that I learned from, but it was a book that gave me peace of mind and confidence that I wasn't a complete freak of nature <laughs> in the way that I was looking at life, you know. But it was it was wonderful validation for some of the things that I was starting to recognize. So then I did a bit of a deep dive into his stuff. Um, I'll always cite the book that I think for me is the most impactful called I Am That, which is by Sri Nisar Gadatta, which is quite a mouthful, but... Um, it's, it's not, it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> it's not, it's not an easy read. It's not a light read, but it is incredibly profound. And that I have, if people see it now, it's so dog-eared. There's probably the equivalent of another, at least one to two books inside of it, just because of all my scribbles around pretty much every paragraph. Um, so that was incredibly instrumental for my growth. Um, and then, you know, more contemporary, I mean, there's all sorts of people from Eckhart Tolle, who you mentioned, you know, um, there's, there's wonderful books out there. Um, I, I haven't read so much the last few years cause I've been focusing more on my own content and writing and working on my own book, which is taking an inordinate amount of time, <laughs> but I'm trusting the process. Um, so yeah, th those Krishnamurti was awesome. Uh, Ramana Maharshi is another I like the traditional gurus the guys are to me really got it right they really they really they saw the matrix and then of course there's the matrix which is a great movie for people to watch and there's some other great movies that's a great documentary love, it is it is I love the last one too the fourth one I think it's just such a beautiful love story but um yeah and then the um the i am that those those are the books that you know when people typically ask me for recommendations they're the ones that i i go to but sure. there's there's a lot of great books out there that will help people for various reasons you know and we all have our different proclivities towards you know certain styles of writing or topics so i don't like to make it carte blanche you've got to do those you know people might find some benefit in tony robbins he's not I don't, he's not my, you know, my cup of tea, but for some people, he's the kind of guy that helps, you know, or obviously Wayne Dyer and Ram Das, and, you know, some great teachers out there. Yeah. I think, I think uh, the book you read, you have to kind of be ready for it. Like I am, that is probably going to be above some people's current levels of comprehension. Whereas, Possibly, yeah. Whereas, I mean, then they'll put it down after a few pages and go, what the fuck is this? Right. You know, and then they'll go to something else. That's fine, you know, but it's, yeah, if you're able to get through it, um, very powerful. Yeah, I think the first, I think it took me 10 years to get through the first Eckhart Tolle book I read. I'd start reading, like, <laughs> yeah. this is a lot of shit. And then a couple of years later, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'll have another crack. And you, it's almost like you yeah. read the same, the same chapter and then you take another chapter in, then you're done. Then you read the first and the second and the third chapter, and then you're done. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that's part of our own evolution, right? Because, you know, you would have been a different person the second time you read it, the third time. Like the old quote that there's no man that steps in the same river twice because he's not the same man and it's not the same river, you know? We, um, after our first year at the podcast, having amazing podcast guests on here, my wife said, how cool would it be to get all these people together in one room? So we started having hmm. these podcast summits. And so we've had, oh, wow. we've had uh, two in America. We've had one in Australia and we'd just come back from the UK. We had one in, in um, a theater in Birmingham. Get this. So you would be aware of all of the riots in England. Yes, lately. that are going on. Okay. Yeah. So we're in Birmingham and I see on the news there's <clears throat> riots all over right this is recently of, you were in birmingham i was in birmingham during the riots oh wow and i think it was you know it's a three-day event and i think the saturday morning the riots had been going on on the friday and when i did i started the the summit off on the saturday morning i said what's really interesting is we're in birmingham now if you said there's like right-wing working class riots in england which city would they be in they'd be in they weren't in birmingham that's the only place they weren't 
And it wasn't wow. until Monday, after the summit was over and we left, that Boeing had had their riot. Wow. But anyway, um, sorry, long story. One of the guests who was there, she was a marine animal trainer from the coast of California up in Santa Cruz. Um, uh -huh. But she's always had this real interest in Buddhism and she's actually closed down her animal sanctuary and moved to England where she's trying to become ordained as a Buddhist nun. Hmm. And on stage at one point in time while I was talking to her, she turned to me and she said, she leant forward and she said, you will not survive this conversation. Okay. Meaning, right. just like you were saying right there, this com you were changing as this conversation is going on. You are not going to be the same. I forget what the quote was that you said, but when you said that, so her name's Jennifer Zellix, but she said, you will not survive this conversation. And I was yeah, like, that's a powerful quote. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I often speak to the same thing. As I said, that one po uh, post that I put up recently about suicidal ideation, you know, I'm speaking about it's not that you don't you don't want to die. It's the part of you that's suffocating the narrative, that's suffocating the life you are that wants to die, right? That misidentification with something that's inadequate uh, or insecure about you right now, that's asking to die. So mm. that's, yeah, you're not going to survive this conversation. It's great. I know I'm not surviving this one. So, Peter, tell us about <laughs> what you are, what are you offering people these days? Like you've mentioned it a couple of times, you have a masterclass and you have a something else. What are, what are, let's yeah. talk about that because um, I'm interested. Yeah. So my, my biggest offerings, I say there's two to keep it simple. The mastermind is a three month um, container where we meet every two weeks with me and we do theory in the morning and then we do coaching in the afternoon. So you get all of the uh, philosophy mechanics of my work and how we as human beings have basically created ourselves to be prisoners of our own narratives. And then in the afternoon, we see people break out of that, which is so inspiring. And then even between the two weeks, we have, uh, I have three mentors that work beneath me and they take people through integrating the work. So mm -hmm. there's more support. There's a community component where you can be part of a feed where we talk to each other and share breakthroughs and there's worksheets. And so that's, that's my biggest offering. And that's online. And then that's online. So people can be anywhere from all around the world. We we've had, I think in one mastermind, we had 28 countries represented, which was amazing. People getting up at two, three in the morning from Asia or Australia, cause they wanted to be part. It's all recorded. So you don't have to do right, that. Yeah. Uh, you can watch it whenever you like. Um, but yeah, I love that. So we're about to start one uh the end of august so my guess is by the time this comes out you know people will miss that because it's coming up on saturday um well this drops on friday so oh this friday <laughs> unless unless you don't want it to no i'd love to yeah. i mean maybe that will get some yeah well okay if people are interested we'll still we tend we tend to leave the gates open a little bit okay. you know people might miss the first one live but they'll still be able to access the recording so if people want to jump in on that that would be great actually we might be able to drop um, this thursday then they've got time to organize themselves okay. for, for that yeah oh that would be wonderful i'd really appreciate that yeah because it's 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 so moving if people just go to the page on my website petercrone.com forward slash or they just can click the mastermind link but you if you just watch some of the testimonials i mean talk about saving people's lives changing people's lives i i think eventually this will become known as that rite of passage for a human being from suffering to freedom mm. it's like you know you just do the mastermind because that's what's going to change people's lives so that's you know but it's a more um it's a more expensive program because it's three months and then i also wanted to make my work available for anybody so i have my platform called freedom which is a membership subscription monthly and it's just 29 dollars a month so you know and it's got 80 hours of uh, my workshops from anxiety, depression, health, relationships. It's got my flagship program, Free Your Mind. I do a monthly Q&A for the community. There's, I think, a wisdom library of over 100 little clips from two to three minutes to inspire people. There's a community component where you get to meet people. It's, it's really beautiful. So they're the two main offerings, yeah. Yeah, I think things like this, a big part of it is the community that gathers <clears throat> because you know, we found it with our podcast summits and stuff is that these people are in a room full of people who are like, you view the world the way I view the world. You've been through the things I've been through. You've, you've made it this yeah. far. You know, I, yeah. I, it's that attunement thing. I get where you're coming from. I'm get, I'm, I get the way you see the world. Yeah, absolutely. I think 
it's so underrated even though people throw that word around a lot community community but you know as human beings one of our primal needs is to belong right like we know tribally if we weren't part of a gang we're not going to survive and so it's still deeply wired into our dna so that's why i feel so blessed to be able to create these communities where people feel very safe you know they feel very seen they feel very heard and they feel fundamentally inspired to uh, access parts of them that they perhaps didn't even know were there laying dormant so that they can live an extraordinary life of freedom, love and possibility. Those are the three main pillars of what I offer in this work. And you mentioned a book earlier. How long have you been writing yep. this book? Have, have you written a book before? No, no. Uh, I mean, I've got a lot of writings, but nothing that's been published. Well, not I've had small things published in articles. But yeah, yeah I haven't, uh, I haven't finished the book. It's coming along. Uh, the Currently, we just went through my schedule for 2025 and 26. And the idea is to release the book around June of next year. Mm -hmm. So um, that will be that will be really fun. So have a working I'm title? To um, I've got a couple that I'm playing with. So I haven't completely decided it yet. And how has has that been for you? Because I wrote a book last year and I'm, you know, I never planned to write a book. So it's not Mm -hmm. it's like pulling teeth i can you put me in front of a crowd of people i can flow but yeah. trying to get for me it was like it was like the freeway in la where it goes from eight lanes to two sort of thing like i'd sit down to write stuff and it's all in there but then it would just get this big old traffic jam and it would all come to a stop how, yeah. how has the writing process for you are you is it easy for you it is i love to write i think I write every day, whether it's an insight, a distinction, a quote, like stuff continually pours through me. I'm prolifically creative that way. I think my challenge and hence opportunity is to kind of put it together in this curated form of a book, right? Like I've got writings all over the place, notes, emails, messages, post-it notes, you know, like there's so much stuff that I have. It's, it's just, you know, putting it together in a way that's coherent in a book, which, which is, it's come along because the structure of my book is actually really nice. And I like there to be this formulaic approach. Like I kind of get a little bit nauseous if I pick up a book and I just flick the pages and it's just copy, copy, copy. It's just, it's overwhelming, you know? So my book is going to have a lot more spaciousness about it, the feeling of it, because it'll have one of my quotes on one page alone, and then I'll expand on it mm. on the next few pages. And so it gives this sort of breathability, I think. Um, so I've got these 10 primal prisons I talk about. So there's 10 chapters that cover each of them. And so I think for people, it will be very it'd be soothing because it's not just jumping around. Oh, you got worthlessness. Oh, and then you got feeling of not being enough. It, it's sort of, as I said, very formulaic. There's almost an equation to liberation. Mm. So it makes it something easy for people to track. So, so that part is easier now because I've got the structure in place. And so I'm just sort of filling in the gaps. Um, so it's more than anything, the challenges. And that's my thing is to dedicate the time to do it you know when i've got so many other things that are pulling at me which are wonderful opportunities that like being on a podcast with you and you know going to speak i've got a dinner on longevity tonight i've got another podcast after this you know so it's it's me being more disciplined in the fact that i cut aside put aside time that is dedicated to the writing which is also something that i'm doing now so it's becoming much more efficient and productive yeah you just mentioned the word discipline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I struggle with that. Do you have Do you have a succinct uh, bit of advice for someone who struggles sure. with discipline? Yeah. The time you most need discipline is when you don't have it. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> can you at least give me something i can argue with you know <laughs> <laughs> nope no nope. <laughs> yeah so the fact that you struggle with discipline is why you need <laughs> like everyone's disciplined when they're disciplined right the very nature of what discipline is is you know i think there's some quote about can you stay committed to something long after you were so inspired to be committed to something right so it's um yeah, it's, I think it's, it, we all struggle with that, right? We can, we can all embrace, you know, our humanity and, and be humble about the fact that we're easily distracted as beings. And there's 
obviously a million things that are calling our attention every day phones and messages and god knows what and families and spouses and kids and work and you know politics and uh, to to really i think to to really be able to tap into our true commitments our true intentions we we have to be very um clear with our scheduling to me the most powerful productivity tool is your is your calendar not a to-do list right so for example you were here i was here on time as we discussed because it was in my schedule it was in my calendar but if it's not in your calendar the chances are it's not going to happen like you know how many people miss a flight of course some people but you know you're talking like 0.0001 percent of you know most people make their flight why because it's it's a scheduled event it's you know the day you know the time and you know where to be so if you if somebody struggles with with productivity the first thing i'd ask them to look at is what are you scheduling that you're doing and what are you scheduling and what are you not scheduling that you're not doing and i can promise you they'll be correlated right like so if you say i want to be in shape but you don't have scheduled whatever that is to you go to the gym go for a walk go for a hike you know pay a trainer whatever if it's not in the schedule it's not going to happen. So discipline, scheduling, uh, re re accomplishing, you know, they, they all belong in the schedule to me. They're all synonymous with being somebody who actually has stuff in your calendar. And then, of course, even that, you can cancel things, you can move things, you can kick them down the road. So then, it, you know, then we start to get into the subtleties of actually being somebody whose words mean something, you know, honoring your language, having integrity, being responsible. These, these are bigger issues. And then when you've got this big backdrop of I'm not good enough or I'm a piece of shit or, you know, you know, when people have that as the way they see themselves, well, now it's, you know, you've got double the weight to overcome, mm. right? It's the, the feeling of inadequacy that isn't inspiring me to see that I'm a powerful human being and that I'm going to create whatever I declare I'm going to create because, you know, the subtext of who I am for myself is I'm not enough and no one gives a shit about me. Like, well, why would that person want to have an extraordinary productive life? So, you know, there's cleaning up on all levels, but for the for the top level strategy, yeah, put it in your schedule and then stick to it because you said you would. Mm, I recently saw a, a quote, wasn't a Peter Crone quote, but it was just as powerful. <laughs> it said, the, the magic you are seeking lies in the work you are not doing. Mm-hmm. Very powerful. And it's like, wow. And like Joseph Campbell said, the treasure you seek lies in the cave that you fear to enter. Mm. Right? Similar, different. Yes. Yeah. Very similar. Okay. So we're going to have to wrap it up here because you've got other stuff yeah. to do. And I want to honor your time. Uh, Thank you, mate. We can always do another one down the road as well. Oh, I'm I'd open to that. To. Um, <laughs> so quickly recap, um, where do people find you? PeterCrone.com. His website, yeah, and then Instagram at Peter Crone, yeah, and then Google Peter Crone, and you'll get plenty. <laughs> uh, what about <laughs> these days. Facebook? You on Facebook? Yeah, Peter Crone Mind Architect, I think it is. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yep. Well, it has been such an honor and a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you taking the time. Likewise, I really loved the conversation and. I'm sorry it was a little shorter than you would have preferred, but as I said, I'm open to coming back on and continuing. And I'd love to see some of your work too. It sounds like you do amazing stuff with these horses, which by extension speaks volumes about who you are as a human. So I'd love to see some of your work, if that's on YouTube or a website or anything like that. They are a great reflection, I tell you. Yeah. Yeah, really. Yeah, I had uh, many clients who've had horses, some who actually did equine therapy for a while yep. with, with kids and stuff. Yep. And I actually worked with one of them, you know, worked with a ton of athletes. And one of my most, uh, I guess, uh, fulfilling stories is working with a girl who was a show jumper. And, you know, like a lot of show jumpers, they come from very resourceful backgrounds because it's not a cheap sport, right. but she was 28th or 9th or something in the US and wanted to make the US team for the World Equestrian Games, which happens every four years, sort of flip flops with the Olympics. So it's yes, sort of I've, their version of. I've, I've been in the World Equestrian Games. Oh, you have? Mm. Different, oh, different okay. discipline. So my wife and I both have actually for Australia, ah. not for America. Oh, wow. Well. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Well, she um, hired me to help her and 
even though it was nine, 10 months out from the games, you know, she was not in the reckoning or in part of the, the picking for the U S team by any stretch of the imagination when she's 28th and they only pick five t five riders and only four compete. But anyway, she, we did so well that her progress was seen as, you know, sufficient and she, she got picked and we went to, it was in Virginia and, um, I think there was 48 nations that compete or something and the U S won, and she got a gold and it was the first time in 32 years. So that's my only experience with horses, but it was, a uh, a very fulfilling one. <laughs> well, that's cool. So you don't know anything about horses, but you helped a very, very, very good horse person be even better at yes. it. And so, yeah, it's, at some point in time, it's yes. not about the horses. Yes, it's about, and what I loved about it was a relationship, you know, and I think, you know, to sort of wrap up, life is about relationship, right? We know ourselves through relativity. Um, you're lying in bed, that bed's hot, you move your leg to the right and it's a bit cooler because the sheets on that side are cooler or whatever. It's all... Life is about relationship and really what I'm working on is helping people have better relationships with themselves and to see the dysfunctional relationship that currently occurs for most people in their subconscious by virtue of just being human and you don't even have to have had a particularly traumatic childhood. It's just the game of being human is that we arrive with these feelings of inadequacy and security and scarcity and the opportunity is to break out of them and discover freedom, love and possibility and I'm all about it. You are all about it and I think, you know, you sir are changing the world so keep rocking it like you are i think you're amazing thank you mate i really appreciate the kind words and it's a pleasure to be with you and for you guys at home thanks so much for joining us and we will catch you on the next episode of the journey on podcast